really useful engines. Dear friends, I am happy to say that Thomas and his friends are still at work, trying as hard as ever to prove themselves to be really useful engines. My father is still taking an interest to the region's affairs, but it is with grateful thanks that I would like to dedicate this book to him, the person who began it all. The author, Christopher Audrey. Stop, Thief Thomas stood at Farquhar, the top station of his branch line. He had run around Annie and Clarabelle after the morning journey and was enjoying a short rest before the run back to the valley. His driver and fireman stood beside his cab, talking to the guard, who had brought startling news. Did you hear that the station master was burgled last night? He was asking. Thomas's driver shook his head. You don't say, he exclaimed. I didn't know he had anything worth stealing. He has won cups for gardening, exclaimed the fireman, all taken, and then the scoundrels had the cheek to pinch his car to carry it away in. Not that new one he's proud of, said the driver. The guard nodded, and at that moment the signal rose to show that the line was clear. The driver and fireman climbed into Thomas's cab. The guard blew his whistle, waved his green flag, got into Clarabel, and Thomas set off. By the time they were through the tunnel, the train was running nicely. Road and railway were beside each other here, with only a stream between them. Thomas remembered his race with Bertie the bus. He'd only won because he could get through the hill, while Bertie had to go over it. A flash of colour on the road ahead caught his eye. He tried to go faster to look more closely. Steady, Thomas, said his driver. There's plenty of time. Can't we get closer to that car? panted Thomas. It looks like station masters to me. Lots of cars look like that, laughed the driver. But he opened the regulator and they began to draw level. There were two men in the car. They waved when they saw Thomas and tried to go faster. That's the car, all right, said the fireman. And those two must be the thieves. But we can't stop them and they'll be gone long before the next station. We need a pencil, paper, and something to put a note in, said the driver. We'll throw a message out to the next signal box. Quickly, he wrote the note, and they put it in the fireman's empty lunch tin. Then, drawing ahead of the car, Thomas whistled to attract the signalman's attention. They slowed so that the fireman could throw the box up to him. And as they went past, both the driver and fireman shouted, Police! at the top of their voices. By now, the stolen car had gone well ahead, and Thomas didn't see it again. But the signalman telephoned police headquarters at once, and the thieves were stopped by a roadblock about ten miles further on. That afternoon, the fat controller travelled in Annie to Farquhar. When he got there, he and the station master climbed onto a porter's trolley. They told the passengers the whole story, and the station master thanked Thomas, his driver, and his fireman for their prompt action. The passengers cheered loudly, and they cheered even more when they heard that the station master's gardening cubs had all been found, undamaged, in a sack in the boot of the car. A long time ago, said the fat controller, holding up his hand for silence, Thomas showed how valuable he is to the smooth running of my railway. I'm sure you will all agree that today he has once again proved himself to be a really useful engine. Mind that bike. Percy had never known Tom Tipper to be anything but cheerful. Tom was a postman at Farquhar, and every morning he would have a cheery word for Percy as he helped to load mailbags onto the train. Percy then took them to the town, where there was a big office for sorting letters. But one morning, Tom wasn't there. A postman they didn't know just dumped the bags onto the platform and bicycled off without stopping to help. What happened to Tom? wondered Percy's driver. And his old van, added the fireman. No wonder this new chap looks fed up. Carrying mailbags on a bike would make anyone miserable. 
Tom was soon back, but without his van. During his illness, it had been decided that the van was too expensive to run. Poor Tom was no longer cheerful, and now had no time to help load the train. I wish I could cheer him up, sighed Percy the small engine. One day, a man came from the station office to tell Tom that some papers needed signing. Oh dear, he said anxiously, this is going to make me very late. He asked Percy to keep an eye on his bicycle while he was gone and propped it carefully against the fence near the platform ramp. He was gone a long time and had not returned when Percy was ready to go. Some boys were playing on the platform and Percy was worried. Sorry, Percy, said his driver. We must be off. Time and the fat controller wait for no man. In the flurry of starting, no one had noticed that one of the boys had picked up Tom's bicycle. He pedaled too far along the platform and before he could stop, ran out of control down the ramp. He reached the bottom just as Percy started away. Fortunately, the boy fell clear in time, but the bicycle swerved beneath Percy's wheels and disappeared with a crunch. Percy's driver stopped the train quickly and they extracted the remains, but the red bicycle was beyond repair. Tom came running, and he, the driver, the station master, and the guard all told the boys what bad boys they were. I'm sorry, Mr. Tipper, apologized Percy. Never mind, Percy, sighed the postman. It wasn't your fault, and I never liked that bike much anyway. When the fat controller heard about the accident, he ordered that Tom should be provided with a new bicycle at once. But the next morning, when Percy arrived at Farquhar, he saw a brand new red van standing in the yard, besides the ruins of the bicycle. Close by stood Tom Tipper, beaming from ear to ear. That accident did me a good turn, Percy, he smiled, and my chief has decided to let me have a new van after all. So I did help, said Percy to himself when Tom had gone, by accident, as you might say. Fish The fishermen, who used the port near the big station, were bringing in more fish than ever before. Each day, the sheds at the quayside were piled high with boxes. Much of this extra fish had to travel by rail, so the trains, which Henry and the other engines had to pull, became heavier. One night, a special load of fish was ordered, and the fat controller decided that extra vans must be added to the train that the men call the Flying Kipper. The only spare vans that they could find were old ones that had been standing unused in a siding for some time. Workmen cleaned them quickly, and they were added to the tail of the train. Henry grumbled dreadfully about it, but there was nothing to be done. You'll just have to put up with it, Henry, said his driver. At least the extra load will mean we can have a banker at Gordon's Hill. Dark often waited at Edwards Station so that he could help heavy trains be pushed behind. Tonight, Henry made good progress in spite of his extra load. When they reached Edwards Station, his driver stopped the train beyond the platform. Then, using Henry's whistle, he gave the special signal, which meant that he wanted help up the hill. <coughs> Whistled Henry. I need a banker, please replied Duck. I shan't be long. Duck buffered gently up to Henry's train. He was not cobbled on, so that Henry can run on without stopping when they reach the top. <coughs> Ready, Duck whistled. Pull hard, pull hard, puffed Henry. We're doing it, we're doing it, replied Duck. Henry was pulling harder than he thought. It was a dark night, and Duck felt the weight on his buffer slacking. Because of the dark, he couldn't see that Henry had taken the train on his own and was slowly drawing ahead. All trains carry a red lamp on the final vehicle to show that the train is complete. This is called a tail lamp. Duck's driver began to be worried. There's no sign of a tail lamp, he said to the fireman, but we must keep going. <coughs> Duck whistled, but there was no reply from Henry. Henry, meanwhile, was going well, but his train seemed to be getting heavier. He had to keep moving, but he couldn't avoid slowing down. 
Suddenly, from behind him, there came a splintering crash. Doug's front bent, and pieces of broken wood started to fall on him. One of them denting his funnel. He stopped quickly, and Henry, feeling jolts, stopped too, just beyond the top of the hill. Over Gordon's hill, a smell of fish hung in the air. By the light of torches, the driver and fireman tried to work out what had happened, while the guard ran back down the hill to warn the signalman. When daylight came, it was all too obvious. The lamp iron on the old van, which should have held the tail lamp, had broken, and the lamp had fallen off to the bottom of the hill. Not your fault, Doug, said the fat controller. That lamp iron should have been checked. Don't worry, we will soon have your funnel and front straightened out. Thank you, sir, said Doug sadly. Thomas told me once to be careful about fish. He was right, sir, wasn't he? Triple Header Gordon was resting in a siding. It was a hot day, and the express had been heavy. I get so out of breath, he complained. But nobody cares. They just say, I'll be all right after a rest. <sighs> get the fat controller to give you tanks and a bunker, suggested Thomas cheekily. You'd feel a new engine. We tank engines never get out of breath, you know. Perhaps it was lucky for Thomas that poor Gordon hadn't the energy to reply. The men worked hard on Gordon, but they couldn't make him better. You need new tubes, Gordon, they said. You will have to go to the works to have them fitted. While Gordon was being mended, Henry pulled the express. But one morning, just before Gordon was due back, Henry was ill too. We have no spare engine except Thomas, the inspector told the fat controller. But he can't pull the train on his own. Could Percy help? asked the fat controller. The inspector shook his head. The two of them, with Doc, might manage, he suggested. It's only as far as the works. They are sure to have a spare engine there. So the three tank engines were coupled together. Thomas nearest to the train, Doc in the middle, and Percy at the front. Then, slowly, they started. Come on, come on, fussed Percy importantly. We're doing it, we're doing it, puffed Doc. Pull harder, pull harder, grumbled Thomas to the others. The heavy train drew out of the platform. The engines couldn't go as fast as Gordon, but the passengers didn't mind. They knew that Percy, Thomas and Doc were trying their best. Expresses are not like branch line trains. They don't stop at all the stations, and their engines don't have the chance to get their breath back. Soon, the three began to feel tired. They struggled valiantly up Gordon's Hill, but the strain was beginning to tell. I'm glad we didn't stick there, thought Thomas. Gordon would never have let us hear the last of it. But the hill proved too much for Percy. His driver blew his whistle and stopped the train. We can't take you off, Percy, said Thomas's driver. Do the best you can to keep your brakes off. It's not far now. This made things harder for the other two, but they struggled gaily on, twin columns of steam shooting high into the air. We're nearly there. We're nearly there, puffed Thomas and Doug together as they summoned a last brave effort. Poor Percy had no steam left to say anything. They were just passing the works when Doug found that he could go no further. Thomas couldn't pull the train on his own, and so the cavalcade came to a standstill a few yards short of the station platform. And there, standing from the work siding, stood Gordon. The fat controller, who had been on the train, told the three engines how proud of them he was. You did very well to get us here, he said, and you now deserve a rest. Doug, Percy and Thomas were uncoupled, and a new engine took their place. As the tank engines moved wearily away, Gordon looked at Thomas and smiled. Then he took three deep breaths and winked. He didn't need to say anything. Thomas knew exactly what he meant.